everybody. Um, hold on a second. Oop, there we go. So we've had our land acknowledgement. Um, I'm just going to do our overview right now. Um, so first of all, who are we? Who are we really, your hosts today? So um, we have Risha and Risha really is a weaver of stories and she is a wool bomber as well and she loves to do art projects particularly with wool out in nature. So that's um, a little something about Risha. Carrie um, is really an advocate at heart um, and really leads us all in our community in advocacy and training and she also has a beautiful dog and likes to recreate all sorts of wonderful works of art, famous works of art with her dog at the center. So that's what I love about Carrie. Joanne is really our Northern Star. She is really the compass that guides us in our community and has connected us all here um, today. Mandy, um, she really loves to push the boundaries. Um, she is a chair of a neighborhood association and the chair of the overall association here, um, but really loves to make things happen like splash pads and making her own trails in her community, which is really amazing. Um, Sylvia has already shown one doodle today. She is an artist, a storyteller, and a, a woman who does so many things, I can't even list them all, a welder to an artist to a motorcyclist, the list is endless. Um, and myself, um, well, I, I love this work and stories um, and I love food. So those are <laughs> some things about me and how, how we do our work. So today we're talking about stories um, and the importance of it. We're going to ask everybody to um, make notes on their own too as well and to harvest information throughout the session any way you see fit. Um, an interesting thing to notice about our PowerPoint presentation today, it highlights ways that we have harvested stories and conversations in our community over the last three years. So as you'll see the PowerPoint, you'll see pictures of art and weaving and poetry. Actually, one of the poems is actually created by an Australian um, who was up here a couple of years ago. Um, so please harvest your work. Um, we're going to have many ways to share that, either in your chat, in our chat space, on whiteboard, in your notes with you where you are, um, and we can uh, share that through email or other ways at the end. But what goes along with that is please uh, realize that this is being recorded. Um, so in even the chat space is recorded. So if there's an issue or um, if you're not comfortable with that, please just let uh, a host know or um, and we can we can figure that out. So I think that is about it. This is our overview of our agenda and we'll walk you through it as we go. Um, and so Carrie is next and she's going to talk about our space here today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm just going to do a brief little piece about the importance of setting space when sharing stories. Uh, so in my job at a community legal clinic, I run workshops in local spaces, uh, working with folks on strengthening their storytelling skills and their advocacy skills so that they can advocate for themselves rather than needing a lawyer. Uh, or if they want a lawyer, they have the skills to be able to bring their stories together uh, and make their work easier for the lawyer so it goes faster, that type of thing. I will introduce you uh, at some point to my dog, Frankie, because he's super loud and there's road work being done in my house. So if you hear a beagle howling, I apologize, but there's I'll, there's zero I can do about that and I'm really really sorry <laughs> um, so I just need to say that up front so that um, it doesn't startle anyone once he starts going so for me I've been doing this work for a long time and uh, at first I thought there wasn't a lot involved with storytelling but once I started getting more into it the last few years I realized that when people 
are coming to these spaces, there's a lot of vulnerabilities in that. There's a lot of strengths, but there's a lot of vulnerabilities. So space setting is really, really important because with storytelling, there is a freedom, but sometimes that freedom can get away from us and we can end up going down into a story that we didn't realize we were gonna go down or someone's story brings us to a place we weren't expecting to go to today. So I feel that it's really important to hold space for others, not to rush people through their stories, but at the same time uh, to support people in that and just that holding of the space and that people always have the right to pass. So if someone doesn't feel um, like even today in your small group, if someone doesn't want to participate, that's okay, that you always have that right to pass. But it's important to check in and make sure that you're not rushing either. So allowing for those moments of silence. So I've been running my speaker schools, which is a storytelling program. I've been running them through Zoom for the last three months. And a lot, sometimes there's spaces where there's just silence for a few minutes because people are working through their story in their own mind or getting comfortable uh, and to position themselves to be able to share their story. So allowing for those moments of silence and not rushing through them. A lot of folks get really uncomfortable with silence and that's okay, but that, um, that discomfort ends up making them rush through something and force people to feel like they have to share when they're not ready to share. So allowing for that silence to happen. And then also not speaking for others. So not making assumptions about what folks' stories mean and taking meaning from those stories, but allowing people to explore their story and frame and contextualize their own story, I think is really, really important. But what I found to be the most important thing out of all the things that I've implemented in order to create safer spaces and storytelling is breathing. And I think if folks want to, there, and when we go into our breakout rooms, there will be a facilitator from our group. And if people just wanna do a breathing exercise at the beginning, if it's just like close your eyes and breathe in deep and then breathe out, I think that helps to set just um, a peaceful tone. It also helps to reduce any anxiety or any need to rush through anything. Uh, and that breathing allows us that moment to bring our minds together. Uh, so one of the breathing exercises that I use, especially when I work with little kids, is uh, smell the flowers, blow out the candle. So you picture a big bouquet of flowers and you breathe it in. And when you breathe it in real deep, like you're smelling the flowers, it causes you to breathe deep, right? Because one of our issues as humans in uh, the societies that, um, you know, are so rushy and so busy that uh, we're doing a lot of shallow breathing. So when I used to be a counselor many years ago, we had a lot of clients who would pass out in counseling sessions because they, you know, talking about hard things and talking about trauma can, can initiate shallow breathing. And then shallow breathing uh, exaggerates anxiety in your body, so or feelings of anxiety in your body. So the breathing can change a lot. So if you're breathing really deep, so you smell the flowers and you breathe really deep, and then you do a full exhale out and you blow out the candle, then you're doing one full breath. And that can just help with the calming of the heart and just creating that peaceful space. So for me, the breathing is the most in, one of the most important things in creating a safer space. And re, again, reminding folks, you have the right to pass, you have a right to sit and listen, you have a right to participate when you're ready to participate, and that silence is okay and that we don't have to rush through things. So those are the main points for about keeping safer space. Thank you, Sarah. So Sylvia is going to be next. Sylvia is going to share with us a story. So we're just going to go over, we're going to have three short examples of stories and then we're going to get quickly into our breakout uh, sessions. So Sylvia? Okay, so I'm supposed to keep it short. <laughs> this, is, um, just, it, this is a quick story actually. This is um, just a quick story about um, the beginning of isolation when um, here in Brantford, everybody sort of went into their homes and isolated and there was a, a lot of change 
really quickly, which was happening all over the world. And um, there, we have a really strong um, neighborhood association in our community, and we have a really strong Facebook page that is active. And there was a lot of comments about people um, checking on neighbors and um, just wondering if everyone was safe and healthy and being at least in touch with someone. So um, we started doing a thing called the Neighborhood Happy Hour. So at four o'clock every day, people would just walk out their front door onto their front porch and just check in with the people that they could see in their, in their direct vicinity. Um, and from that came a really cool story from my next door neighbor who came out and she was talking about her mom who was quite isolated in a long-term care facility. She was in the, um, in a lockdown ward. So she was, she has dementia. And one of the things that she uses is an, um, the old iPod shuffle. So they would load the iPod shuffle with the music. And then she, because she, with her mental health difficulties, she wanted to have music in her head all the time. So she would wear her headphones and listen to her iPod shuffle all day long. Um, so what was happening was the, they couldn't get in to her mom and her mom was getting frustrated with the, um, the batteries running out on the shuffle. So she would throw them away. And so they were, because they're not new technology, they were having real trouble um, accessing these these shuffle iPods that the mom could manage. And so she was just talking about her frustration and saying, you know, we don't really know what to do. Like, how do we find a source for these things? And we watch Kijiji all the time and we were watching Marketplace all the time. And myself and a neighbor on the other side both said, well, we have one of those. I have one of those and I'm not using it. You're welcome to have it. And so we were able, just in that short, little exchange of, of news, we were able to get two iPod um, shuffles for, for her mom. And she was able to then have three of them on rotation. So she would always have a charged one that she was dropping off to the nursing home. So as soon as it started to be frustrating and the, the mom couldn't manage it, they would just swap it out right away. And then she would bring it home and recharge it. And so she was able to be isolated, have her music, and rotate the iPod shuffles, and it was a really awesome solution for them. So, and it came out of the simplest idea and just an exchange of how's your day and how's it going, and it was it was a really great conclusion to a, a story that could have been super frustrating. So, Carrie is going to talk about a story. Um, that she has about her community. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, so <clears throat> I live in a small community and uh, it's a rural community that's full of lots of little towns and lots of big spaces that are farming in between. And it's actually part of the catchment area of the community legal clinic that I work for. And so, when I was thinking about what story I wanted to share, I had so many in my head, but I kept circling back to this one particular story. And it's that I was working with a group of women who live in a very uh, rural part of our county. And I had been actually facilitating a workshop that Joanne, who's one of our counterparts with us today, designed that's around self-advocacy. And we've been working on that all winter. Uh, these are that this is a community where most folks are engaged in agricultural work during the growing season. So during the winter, they uh, belong to a mom and tots group that meets every morning, Monday to Friday. So I would go out on Thursday morning and we would work on self-advocacy skills. <clears throat> so at the end of the program, I was talking with the women about how the self-advocacy program had impacted their lives and everyone was very quiet because it's a very quiet community and uh, they don't easily share and finally someone said that the way that m our program our self-advocacy program had impacted her life was that now when she goes to stores uh, she asks for help and now when she goes to the doctor's office, so she can't find milk in the store, 
prior to the course, she used to just walk out of the store. After engaging in the self-advocacy course, now she was asking for help in a store and finding the milk and not just leaving. And also another, so then that prompted another woman to share that when she went to the doctors, he was trying to make her sign papers that she wasn't clear on and that she wanted to take home and review. And she never would have done that before. She never would have asked for that space without some of the skills that she acquired through the self-advocacy program. So for me, those two stories really stood out because they inspired other women to think about the ways they could incorporate self-advocacy into their life. And that doesn't always, self-advocacy doesn't always mean that you're coming up against the, the government or you're coming up against your boss, that it can be these, these other actions in your daily lives where you're enacting your rights. And I think it was inspirational for everyone in the room. And I mean, for me, uh, when I was younger, I was involved in a lot of activist work. And I think if my younger self saw me now, I think my younger self would be critical of me in some ways in terms of thinking that, you know, oh, now I'm teaching storytelling, now I'm teaching self-advocacy, and I'm not doing that more active activism but I think that there's something revolutionary in storytelling and in sharing those experiences so I, I I think that and that's how I would explain it to my younger self if my younger self were to question what I'm doing now about just having a, a more comfortable existence but I think that seeing how those stories sparked the other women to be thinking about self-advocacy um, in many many different forms in their life and I was really surprised when I told our funder about that experience because obviously, uh, obviously I have to be accountable because I am paid, for, uh, my wages are paid by the government. And sometimes I, I worry that they're not gonna understand how meaningful community work can be. And I was really surprised when they reacted the way they did to those stories. They're like, well, that is, really moving that is uh, that is game changing, that is social change at work in this small rural community. So that's the example of a, that. Anyway, I had so many stories in my head, but that's the one I kept coming back to. So uh, thank you for listening to that one. Uh, and Joanne, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. So I also have a uh, dog. So I'm glad Carrie's muted because the dog barked earlier and got mine um, going. So that might happen. Um, so what I'm going to do is share kind of the origins of this, this group um, through a story. Uh, so when, when the, the um, pandemic hit, a lot of us who do community work were, were um, a bit at a loss. Like, how do we proceed? How do we continue the work of engaging and building capacity and making connections uh, in this new world? And um, so I know I felt at a loss um, because to me, Zoom didn't cut it. Um, and it was a new thing as well, new technology. Um, so then uh, we got together through Zoom and had our first meeting. And then uh, we were just throwing a lot of ideas out. Um, and over time, we came up with, and we had a few meetings, we came up with the idea of Humans of Brant. And that was based um, on, there's a social media site and a, and a website called Humans of New York. And I don't know if anybody knows of that, but if you Google it, um, you'll see. And there's this is a storytelling um, activity. So uh, there's amazing stories of resilience uh, in that. And we thought Brant, Brant, Brantford, where we are, has a also amazing stories of resilience and um, and how do we gather those stories and how do we help people uh, come together while they're they're apart and um, and navigate this so then we uh, because you know people ha you know have heavy things happen they, they're silly things they're profound they're playful so how do we bring all those stories and, and connect people to those stories and to each other. 
So we uh, we started our journey and uh, created our own media pages. Like we have Facebook and Instagram, and we started gathering uh, questions that we started to post, and we posted those on billboards in front of organizations, and we'd rotate the questions, and then uh, ga- and we're still gathering uh, some of those questions, and then community people also have been sharing stories. So some of us have been reaching out to individuals. Um, I personally was able to gather a story from someone who's profoundly hard of hearing and then um, what their journey has been and um, looking for supports overall before the pandemic and now. And um, and we were able to post that story. So that's the origins of, of this group, Humans of Brandt. Um, so we, uh, and we're continuing, it's not over. And I, I, and I think when, when uh, this pandemic lifts, um, when we're able to, to function again by meeting in person and so on, we're gonna continue uh, because I think it's a great opportunity to, to really look at the resilience and, and uh, sharing those honest, heartfelt stories. And like Carrie said, they are transformative. Um, stories are transformative. So that's why we're doing what we're doing today. So, um, so I hope you, you can uh, deep dive into your own stories. And, we, and I know Sarah, um, you're gonna guide people to the next phase through the next phase. So that's that. So um, hold on two seconds here. So um, in just a moment, Risha is going to go over the details of the breakout, but I just wanted to, these are going to be our first breakout questions. And um, but I just wanted to bring your attention to the weaving that is here and also behind Risha, if you can see her on her wall in her office. Um, and this is a story of Jane's walks. If anybody knows of Jane Jacobs, just put up your hand. Jane Jacobs is an urbanist um, that, worked in, that worked in North America and she believed in um, walkable communities and small neighborhoods. And we've done Jane's walks here for three years. Um, and this is the story of our first Jane's Walk. And you'll see the blue represents the Grand River, which cuts through our community. Um, but also the blue was a walk that children did. So everybody on the walks, about 600 people were given pieces of wool and they were told to tie knots or pieces of or whatever hit them during their time and things that they learned or stories they heard. And so they tied their stories and experiences into the wall. And then we had artists um, uh, or curators um, color the wool and then put it together into this beautiful weaving. So every color you see is a different walk. There was a rainbow walk that happened. Um, and the six pillars, um, of the Six Nations, which um, is in our community, uh, founders of our community, as Joanne um, uh, mentioned in the land acknowledgement, are the base of the weaving here in the purple. So I just wanted to share that really quick before we move on. Risha. <laughs> Well, actually, Sarah, it's uh, Mandy that's going to share the breakout session information, yeah. <laughs> but thanks. Um, so now we're going to get ready to move into our breakout sessions. We've created a set of questions for each of the breakout sessions. Um, we will place those in the chat box for you, and we'll be telling you about them ahead of time. Um, while you're in the small groups, if you could take a moment and introduce yourself to each other, that would be great and use the chat feature to record some of the key points from your group. That information will be recorded for the conference organizers. We also ask that you have someone keep an eye on the clock. There will be a one minute warning message that counts down for you to let you know when it's almost time to come back to the large room. When we come back into the large room, we will ask two to three groups to share what was emerging for you. 
the first question set is um, what would inspire you to tell your story? No. Oh, sorry. No. Um, it's on the, I looked on there. Okay, sorry. Uh, the first question set is what is the value of a story? Is it the telling and being heard or the listening and hearing? You will have 10 minutes. When you see the invitation to join the room, all you do is click yes. One of us will be back in the main room if you have any problems. I think we're almost all back. Is there anybody left out there, Nathan? Nope, okay, we're all back in the room. Welcome back. <laughs> um, it, that was a pleasure. Um, are there a couple of groups to start that would be interested in sharing what was emerging for your group as sort of some themes from your conversation? Again, like raise your hand or unmute and go. <laughs> what was emerging? There's somebody up there. Oh, do I see any hands? Ashley. Ashley. Yeah, so for our group, we discussed that um, the storyteller, it creates a lot of um, power and creates vulnerability, which allows other people to want to share their stories as well. Um, and that once somebody opens up, which um, takes a lot of courage to do, it helps others in the room feel more comfortable that they can tell their story if they want to. Thank you. Great. Is there someone from another group that would like to share? Deb. Yeah, Deb, Deb down there from the UK. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so one of the things we talked about was the relationship between the person telling the story and the person hearing the story. Um, that there was a, a connecting that goes on between them, um, you know, that, uh, you know, the person telling the story is, is really, you know, sharing that something really um, has significance to him or her in some way. And the listener is really listening for um, more than just what happened in the story often, you know, when you hear a good story, you're, you're as some, as one of the, uh, I think as Mebel put it, you're listening between the lines, um, which I really like that, you know, uh, thinking about that, so. Lovely, thank you. Listening between the lines, that's a, a beautiful takeaway. I like that, thank you. We have time for one more group. Is there anybody else? And I'm just shuffling through the, the squares here. Anybody else interested in sharing? I think uh, our group talked about being present, um, but we talked about a lot of things. And one of them is just as important to learn to listen as it is to tell the story. Um, and that uh, as a listener, to be present uh, as opposed to being distracted about what you're going to say next or the past or the future or filtering the story. So it, uh, that's something that came up and trust building trust, um, in that relationship. That is great. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. I, if I, if I could, I'm not supposed to be facilitating, but I really struck me some really awesome words um, around how a story can make something um, complicated and hard, make it relevant and easier to understand. Um, that's really impactful. And then on the flip side of that, um, Wendy shared that, or it can make something really rich, something simple, rich and textured, which I really appreciated those words as well. So thanks to my group, that was really awesome. Great. Okay, I'm going to um, pass it over to Mandy again, just to give us some instructions for our next, our next set of questions, or our next questions, and then chat too. What would inspire you to tell your story, and how do we get others to share their stories? Again, if we could have someone watch the clock and use the chat feature to record some of the key points. And then when we come back together, we'll discuss some of the key thoughts that come out of these groups again. And 
Nathan, I think we'll take five minutes for this one. <laughs> All right, welcome, welcome back. Sorry, in our group, Heather got cut off. She was just telling something so beautiful. Uh, so, uh, thank you for. I'm just loving my group. All Canadians. I got a group of Canadians. <laughs> um, let's let's open up. Let's. Is there a group that would like to um, share about how? how you were inspired to tell your story and how you inspire others. Timothy, go for it, man. Yeah, I need to... oh, okay. Tim. No, I, now, can you hear me now? Yep, we can. Oh, okay. So we talked about how the setting's really important, like for example, a campfire, gets people in the mood. Uh, also, um, someone might want to share a story because they want to help somebody through a situation to share their wisdom it might involve some self-disclosure. Uh, it's important to create the right atmosphere, make you feel welcome. People know each other's names, and uh, uh, and just that trust is really important. People have to feel safe, and uh, yeah, this is important. Excellent. Great. Great. Thank you, Tim. Is there another group that would like to share? Anyone like to share what's emerging for them from their conversation? I'm scrolling through. I'm not even sure how many rooms there are right there. <laughs> oh, Teresa. So we would echo what Tim said about being feeling safe. Um, you're more likely to tell your story if you feel safe but also feeling um, like you have careful listeners, people who are truly listening to your story and not just, um, you know, sort of distracted um, and feeling valued, feeling that your story is gonna be seen as a true, uh, a true experience. Right. Uh, it's, Karen. it's Carrie. Okay. Go for it. Uh, yeah, our group, we talked a lot about they, like what's already been shared about uh, feeling safe uh, so that you don't feel judged or shamed, but at the same time about reducing, especially if there's a facilitator, about reducing any perceived power hierarchy and how important it is to model vulnerability so that people feel safe in their own vulnerability and that there's, as um, one person in our group said, the, the power of vulnerability and that if we're modeling vulnerability, that people do feel safer and that there's, the tension is reduced and mm -hmm. it starts to create a space where people feel okay opening up and feel safe in that. And it might be a, a process or an evolution, but it's, it's that everyone being open to being vulnerable and having the facilitator model that. Nice. Excellent. Does anyone like to add to that from another group? Yeah. Did anybody yeah. talk about how? Any? I'm wondering, we're, we're saying vulnerability quite a bit, even when we came back to the room last time. And I think we tried to do that, Carrie, with setting the space. That was part of intention of ours to sort of talk about that. So did anybody give any other examples of how people have um, work through that and how people have tried to um, just different things. Any tips or tricks on how to do that? Well, I shared a little bit about um, I live in Kenora, Ontario, and I work for um, Community Living, and we do um, arts-based programming for different vulnerable populations. And um, just with us, a lot of it is just a really like long-term relationship building, which not everyone has the privilege to do, but we're working with people over um, like months and months and years even. So a lot of it is just working on that, establishing that like secure attachment relationship and how it just takes a really, really long time. Um, mm. But yeah, a lot of it is that. Nice. Lee Leanne. Sorry, had to unmute. Um, 
I also work with, with Riley, um, but my approach is more visual arts where I, I actually will have a space of time, maybe it's six weeks or eight weeks and we'll meet once a week. But in coming together over a common interest, um, people, uh, are, a safe space is created. And in that time, people get to know each other. Um, one of the things I'm doing right now is through is working with a journal online. I'm doing it with a as a journal. And we give prompts each week. And with that prompt, um, we do a little discussion, discussion group. And, and surprisingly, quite a lot of stories happen from that. And then as the page is done, the next week, we, uh, people come back and they'll talk about their pages. And from those pages, um, stories are, come out of it. Um, so it's, it's finding something that's common between you, whether, whether it's an art-based thing or another type of uh, activity. Um, and then I always lead with my story so that people um, feel that the space, the space is safe and that I'm a little vulnerable, and then people will be vulnerable in return. Thanks, Leanne. Yes, I'm, I'm seeing that's a really key point. I'm seeing that in some of the, the other pieces that are in the chat. I know that came up in, in our group as well. Really good point around your willingness to be vulnerable as well. That's amazing. That's great. Last couple minutes on this, is, are there other thoughts? Mandy, yes. Oh, Hi there. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I think that I, I agree with with what everyone has said about in the groups because we come in depending on the type of group we can feel quite vulnerable and unsure of what this is going to be all about. And as a facilitator coming in gently, but you know, with a with a, a clear understanding. Uh, one of the first things that that I like to see that's important is to to set the premise that what we talk about here stays amongst us. That, you know, we're among friends here, though we may not know one another, we're here for common purpose. And then as a facilitator to, to begin the conversation with a, with a question that is, it's, 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 um, it's gentle enough to not scare people if we're coming from a vulnerable place, but it, 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 it takes us within ourselves to really think about the answer or the story. <clears throat> and then to share our story as the facilitator, to share something that shows our own vulnerability and, and how it's affected us and not necessarily how, how we overcame this or that because, um, because it can be a messy process sometimes. And so it shows the humanity of us all, and that makes it okay for someone else to be able to show their vulnerability because we're willing to go there ourselves. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, this vulnerability piece is, is key, um, and this whole piece around, there's, there's some, I'm sorry, I'm, the, the chat stuff is rich. <laughs> I, uh, so I, I highly recommend people have a look there, um, and we will be capturing that. There's a lot of great stuff. I just want to, Rebecca was just sharing that validation is important when she's feeling vulnerable, um, validating that um, her experience is real and emotions are valid. Um, so starting off by letting you know that, uh, her know that your experiences are true. I, I love that and, and can't be disputed. Um, one of the things that we struggled with with Humans of Branch was that people at first didn't want to respond. Like we felt like we're hearing like, I'm not a hero in this pandemic, for example. And so my story isn't, no one would want to hear my story of trying to homeschool my kids while working from home. Or someone, should, but someone so, sort of broke their ice and said, I'm really appreciating naps. <laughs> and uh, we're like, that's a real story. <laughs> and it, it kind of speaks to where some of us are at. Um, and so getting, you know, getting someone to be vulnerable, but that I love all of this of how do we validate people, you know, in our group, Heather was just sharing some really cool stuff around, um, yeah, feeling that my story has value. So I love all of this, all of the comments. Maps are stories. Yes, they are. They are. <laughs> Awesome. Can I sorry? Yeah. Can I just jump in here? Yeah, please have say me. just so I'm not a I'm not a counselor. I'm you know so 
my thoughts and stuff are coming from me as a resident or a citizen in my community. And mm -hmm. for me, it's questions, like asking mm -hmm. questions. And my husband hates when I go to the grocery store because I'm only getting a bag of milk, but it's <laughs> half hour because I, he's like, do you know that person? No. And it's just like, how's your day going? And, you know, like, uh, that's a really great shirt. Where did you get it from? And, you know, just having, like, just asking the right questions. And then um, what we use at work is tell me more. Because mm -hmm. tell me more means that you are interested in and validating what they're saying. And that one, like that one question, tell me more. My husband says, please don't use that question because <laughs> he's like, we can never get anywhere. But yeah, so that's just my, my, I didn't get it out in our group, but that's my. I, I love that. Thank you. Hey, being, being curious. I love it. I think too, I was thinking back to uh, something in our previous, I think our first group and Jeff brought up, um, being comfortable in silence um, because sometimes we are always trying to fill the silence instead of sitting in it and allowing it to be, um, you know, and that's part of vulnerability too, is allowing that mm -hmm. silence to be without filling it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Now it was recommended by the, organizers that we give people a five minute break. Are there those, maybe uh, raise your hand if you, if you need to grab coffee and need five minutes. I've, I've, I'm seeing one, two, I'm seeing it. Okay, five minutes everybody, go team, but come back in five minutes. <laughs> and don't take us with you. <laughs> Have we started? We are started, we are, let's go. Okay, Mandy, do you wanna, Sarah's gonna put up a slide and Mandy's gonna take us out to our next small group. All right, so the next set of questions for your groups to consider, how do you use stories in your life and how would, and how, or do you want to use stories in your life? What, what's the impact of stories for you? You'll have about 10 minutes. These conversations, awesome. Let's uh, let's dig in. Who would like to share um, how you use stories and how you want to use stories, or or anything else that came up in your conversation? Because I know the questions are just guiding questions. Who would like to go? I'll go first. Okay. If you want. <laughs> um, we talked about how. Um, using stories can make a community more compassionate. So when you meet people face to face, you go out into your community and you just meet people, they're like a flat piece of paper and you don't know anything about them. And then as you start to learn the stories of the people in your community and in your day, they start to take shape. And so then when you go out and meet that person again, they have a shape and you remember something about them. And then you just approach people more caringly and compassionately. Um, and I think if everybody took more time to find out the stories of the people that they meet, like Heather was saying, I have the same experience when I go out into my community. My children stopped going anywhere public with me when they were about six years old. <laughs> but I know a lot of three-dimensional people in my community. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that if we all took more time to do that, that people would be more accepting and more caring and more supportive and more compassionate. Cool. Thank you, Sylvia. Who else would like to share? Carrie. I can go. Sure. Yeah. We were talking, well, one, we didn't quite get all the questions written down, so <laughs> we we're sorry about that. Um, but we ended up talking about, like, you know, how it builds connections and, sorry, I'm just looking down at my notes, uh, and relationships, and that even, like, when you're dating, you're sharing stories to get to know each other and build trust, and that when people remember stories, it's like you're remembering who they are. So if you remember a story about me, you're actually remembering me. 
and just that being seen and heard. But we also talked about using it for social change, but then the dangers of that, because when do we know that we fully have someone's consent and story sharing? Mm -hmm. And when is it that someone, they may be giving their consent to share a story, but maybe they feel obligated to in order to receive a service. So there was a food bank example that was given, but we were talking about when funder, if, if storytelling is being used in our actual programming services and, and, or maybe it's not, but funders want us to use storytelling to be accountable, then what's that ethical line? When does it become voyeuristic or to tokenism or objectification? And how do you know you have someone's true, cons true consent for that without feeling obligated, but also being accountable and also sharing what folks experiences are because it's through that sharing of experiences that you build awareness about various social issues that can lead to social change but it's also about that leads to the credibility of your and then so there's two pieces that can lead to social change but there's also about building credibility and accountability for your agency and those stories can do that but where's the ethical lines on that with consent <laughs> Deb is just sharing in the chat, it's along the same lines, we talked about the integrity of sharing stories that belong to other people. Um, yeah, when we're, we're, we talked a lot earlier about vulnerability and asking people to be vulnerable, and then how do you honor that? Excellent. Anybody else interested in sharing? Looking for hands. Oh, Deb. Yes, Deb. Go for it. Okay, um, so uh, Mabel and I talked in our group and um, she thought I should quick share this little story with you all because um, I think it's a good one. Um, it, it's, so in our, in our community, we bought our house here um, in this tiny community of 700 people. We bought our house uh, 15 years ago, but moved here full time two years ago. And we were moving from uh, a mid-sized city in Wisconsin and when we when we were selling our house, we had open houses where people come through through the house, and everyone would ask, you know, where are you moving? And so when they, because they want to know why are you leaving the neighborhood or whatever, but we would say we're moving to Door County, which is a a, a section of a, a big county in Wisconsin. And we had a young couple, Hannah. It turned out their names were Hannah and Steve, who who asked us that question, and we said Door County, and they asked where. And we told them we were moving to Washington Island. Um, and they immediately started laughing because it turned out Hannah had taught here at the school for two years. And her family was like one of the families here on the <laughs> island that everybody knew. And so they were the people we wound up selling our house to. And we joked that we had to make sure we left it in good, good shape because everyone in, on Washington Island would know that we hadn't if we hadn't left it in good shape. But the really funny part of the story is that for at least a year afterwards, we would go into a restaurant or we'd be at an event and we'd have people come up to us and say, are you the people from Madison that sold the house to Hannah and Steve? And that's how that was the story they knew about us, that we were the people that sold our house to Hannah and Steve. And it was the way that people opened up conversations with us. And at that point, you know, you think, OK, now I have and we actually talked about this. We, we talked about how do we respond? How do we tell our part of the story? Because their story was, we were the people that sold our house to Hannah and Steve. But up here, people get to know you by saying, who are you and whose house do you, did you buy? Or whose house do you live in? So where you live is really important to people up here. Um, but you know, to this day, we're still, people identify us. You know, people come and tell us that Hannah and Steve just had a baby. You know, we met them like once. <laughs> No, twice at the closing of the house too. And yet, you know, that's the connection people have with us here. So uh, I just wanted to share that because I think it's that relationship building I keep coming back to and how those stories fit in everyday life. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so story. much for bringing up. Yeah. I love the, the importance of place. I just think that is so important with story. Um, there's a woman here in Canada called Zita Cobb who talks she does asset-based community development work in Newfoundland um, in a small um, Fogo Island off the coast. And she talks about the importance of place 
Um, so thank you, Deb. It's a great story. That is great. Maybe we'll take time for it. What is there one more share from a group? Nathan mm. has a story here. Nathan has a story. Go for okay, it. Okay, fine. I wasn't in a group, but I'd, I'd like to make an observation on this question because I think it's cool um, of how can we use stories or what, what can they be useful for. Um, I like to see stories in, in my practice as a way of circumventing permission for things. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I, I tend to find working with community, we are the mischief makers. We like to sometimes do things that are a little bit naughty. Um, but sometimes we want permission from people to do them. And I find that stories are a really good way to bypass permission because when people know people have done stuff that is equally mischievous or crazy, they are more happy to do it without permission from someone else. So I, I like to use it when you're working with a community who you can see is just about there. They want to do something and they're kind of, but they're a bit unsure over whether or not it's okay to do the things they want to do. A, a good story can get them there. So I, I, I like them for that. I like that, Nathan. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think uh, Yeah, Nathan must give us an example. Yeah, <laughs> nice Conrad. Yeah, press them. Good. Go for it. <laughs> Do you have a story to tell us, Nathan? Mm. I, I, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was working with a community who um, had a problem with speeding traffic through their neighborhood. It was an arterial road um, and it was there was a school on the road so there was concern about it. They'd been going to the council for a while um, asking them to to do something about it whether that be to put in traffic lights, speed bumps, um, police stops but to be perfectly honest the council wasn't interested. It was too expensive. It was an area that was not um, socio-economically advantaged enough to be of concern. Not high voter turnout so really not of concern. Um, and the community was at something of a dead end. The good thing with these communities though is you tend to find people who are a little bit more happy to get and um, do things that the council isn't happy with them with. And they also had a scrapyard in this community. So what they decided to do was go and get tires and put chicanes in the road that they would paint. Um, it slowed the cars down. The council came out and removed the chicanes that they put up with the tires filled with dirt. And the next day they were back and it became a bit of a game of cat and mouse where the council would come out and remove the tires and the people would go and put the tires back up and the council would send people to stop them putting the tires up and they wouldn't put them up and then the people would go away and then the, so the tires would be back up in the morning and so on and so forth until it became too expensive to keep removing the tires so the council put in a speed bump. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> A very simple and inexpensive way to utilize the existing asset of the um, scrapyard in town and get the council to do their job and make it safe. Oh, that is a good story. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Conrad, for getting them to do that. That was brilliant. Thank you, Nathan. Good stuff. <laughs> Well, this is a good point to move on, I think. I don't know if anyone can top that for now. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Mandy. He's gonna send us out with a big, a big question. So we're gonna take a little bit of extra time. Um, we'll, at least we might, we might need 15 minutes for this, um, or at least 12, make it 12, Nathan, <laughs> if you can do that. <laughs> okay. So our last question for today is what is, our world story right now. Each of us, each of you has a story we've gathered here from around the world. For the next uh, 12 minutes, we'll talk in, talk in your group about what has been hard for you during this time, what is inspiring you, what would you like to take forward from this time? Great, thanks Mandy. I will put those questions in the chat box too. So by this time, do you mean like right now, today, or the pandemic, or can you, what's this yeah. time? Yeah. This time we are living in right now. It could be the pandemic, and there are lots of other things going on, too. Okay. So not today, not the last hour. Not the last hour. Okay. <laughs> Although it's been good. <laughs> right. Awesome. What a good conversation. Oh my goodness. 
Um, who, who would, did, does anyone have a world story to tell us? Does anyone want to share what was emerging for, for your group? I'm looking through. I think we're still trying to figure it out. This, the yeah. world story. Yeah. Um, Con Conrad, um, we, we had a phenomenal moment in our group. Um, yeah. And that was the story of silence. It was amazing. Normally, we always like to fill up a space with talking. People are uncomfortable with mm -hmm. silence. So we had a nice close moment of silence. Nice. Uh, Timothy has his hand up. Timothy, go oh, sorry, yeah. Timothy, please. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, just to briefly, that was a great discussion. And uh, we talked about how the world has changed a lot, like, you know, just during this time. Uh, there's dolphins. I forget where they said they were swimming, but, you know, we're seeing dolphins, we're seeing deer and animals all over the place. The world's vibrating left. And we talked about how the world's been kind of turned upside down. Somebody said it's like a veil has been removed, and it's like it was the way it already always was. You know, farmers are important, food is important, things we should think about. But then we also talked about the concern about what's going to happen when things go back. You know, are we going to lose that awareness? And there was a sense of, um, you know, some of the things that came out of this, the fact that we can come together like this, which is quite amazing. You know, uh, so many people coming together from all over the world. And uh, a sense of, you know, fear, but also hopefulness. Like this is a, a, a time of revolution. You know, we don't know what's going to come from it, but there's so much happening on so many levels. Thank you. Good point. It's amazing. Is there another group who would like to share? See any hands up? Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I'm flipping back and forth between uh, screens here to look for folks. Leanne. All right, so our group talked about the fact that it didn't really matter what the um, what the issue was on the grand scale of the world because there is so many right now that we've been turned like you said Timothy up on our heads but the fact that the thing that emerged was how important the story was and how important it was connecting at a at a level where it was more personal, where it was either in groups like this or with our neighbors down the way and how collecting and, and engaging and um, just um, conversing with the people on a, on a smaller scale and how we brought it back to um, um, just the stories being the, the, giving you the ability to cope with whatever or to spear you into action as um, Conrad had said, um, with whatever the, the issues were. So on that grand scale, it didn't matter, but collecting those stories, engaging in those stories, and um, just spurring us to action or coping was the way that we saw the stories to help us this time. Mm, nice, nice. Great. Is there another group that would like to share? I can share from our group, maybe, um, unless someone else from our group wants to chip in. Anybody? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wendy laughing at me. Okay. We. Uh, I. I. There was a. There was a moment during our group. Um, I got some real, as people know me, I got pictures in my head. And uh, uh, Heather said, "I'm not a fork in the road." And at first, I just threw a fork in my head, and then I was like, and then as other people were sharing, um, I, I started to actually picture, um, Jolene actually talked about a milestone. We were talking about seniors and how we would reflect on, you know, before COVID. Um, and I, so I got that one of those old, like, road markers in my head and this fork in the road and how all of our stories we, we really shared about sort of one road 
in that fork was sort of like how we were feeling personally. Um, we talked a lot about um, how that started. We, we think, and I'd be really interested to hear from other parts, we are all Canadian, so we'd really love to hear from others, um, that there's a lot of um, lines of privilege on that road um, for those of us who um, have more power or were able to work during this time or not work during this time, um, folks who are um, in abusive situations and, and how long some of those stories will actually take to come out um, post COVID. Um, but lots of stories of, of personal resilience. Um, and right near the end, um, we were just talking about hitting, that you need sometimes to hit the bottom before you could see opportunity on that personal road. And then on the community part of the fork, um, we're really just lots of stories um, that you know, we're amusing about. Um, and we had a great example from Oshiran, a, a, a housing community um, that Heather was working with and, and how, um, how cohesive they are. They don't have a lot of power on an individual level, but um, collectively they've been able to really pull together and um, make an impact for them, like with themselves and take care of themselves. And we we're just sort of musing about the um, role of, of institutions in trying to solve our problems, whereas neighborhoods and citizens have been nimble and quick to react and support one another. So that whole emergence of, of citizenship in this fork in the road. Um, I think we all admit that as much as there's been a point at which we, although we are people, people, um, that with we're almost there's there's some concern um, about going back. I think it was said earlier, um, and that there's a part of COVID that we liked, um, a time this this time of pause to reflect, and um, we're wondering if if other people if that if that that's similar across the world as well. Anyone want to comment on that? Did I capture that? I'm getting some nods from Heather, thanks. <laughs> Does anyone want to add to that? Um, for my group, uh, we talked about um, just how um, we, we, we are like part of the script, right? We are writing the story from our experience and leaving something for the, the next generation to learn from. Um, um, this brilliant lady in my group said something about um, how we learn from from the, the Spanish flu time, and, and and this is our time, and we're uh, what we do now is going to leave that blueprint for the for the next generation to learn from. And we talked about how uh, they the pandemic basically is exposing. Um, all this injustice and and at the same time just empowering people to come out and, and connect and, and and challenge this 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 issue that that, that that the pandemic has has exposed right um and and it was it was really interesting that uh um like the things that has emerged um we talked about uh, just talking about the connections and, and we felt like um, there's tons of people that are not connected because of um, the um, um, we are taking advantage of all this new experiences using Zoom to connect and other devices but then there's technology or tools that we have and missing out and on the other hand we might just taking us away from the connection out there from people. oh you're freezing up a little that. bit all right so you're, you're freezing up a little bit on us or so Next, uh, out there without using tech. Yeah, so the use of use of technology. I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just looking at the clock, and we have two so, minutes left. Um, oh, sorry, again, we have All right, we we have two minutes left. 
Um, thank you, everybody, for sharing. I, my goodness, this has been rich, and I, there's all the comments. I, I just want to say that they are going to be, um, they are going to be recorded and, and downloaded. And at some point, there's going to be like a some graphic art done on this. I believe from the organizers. I'm going to pass it over to Sarah. I'm sorry to that we don't have more time to hear more from all of you, but um, Sarah's just going to quickly wrap up for us. So really quickly, what's on the screen is a wrap-up poem that Tim Darby from Perth and his wife, Shani Graham, created for us. And I'd like us to do the same. If everybody could put a word or phrase in their chat before they leave, and I will do my best to collect those, and we're going to try and make a poem. That's going to be a wrap-up poem that'll record our story. So it can just be just whatever word you're thinking of. Make sure it's sent to everyone and I'll make sure I either wrestle it away from Nathan or I will do a cut and paste. And thank you so much everybody and have a great day and enjoy and be well. The photo, Sarah, the photo. This is my favorite moment, the photo. Group the photo. Oh, right. oh the photo, okay, okay. I'm stopping the share. Nathan. Nathan is tired. He's been at it all day. Sarah, you only came on now. Nathan, do your job. Is Nathan still there? He is. Thanks. Everybody get ready. Everybody smile. We need to do two. We've got two screens here. So, um, right. I don't know what group you're in, so you're going to just need to do cheese twice. Well, I'm going to get this set up. Cool. Right. All right. Yeah, and Nathan fell asleep, yeah. Steady. Uh, it's coming, it's coming. Sleep is two minutes from now. Uh, say cheese. 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 <laughs> okay, that's, that's good. number one. And, and the next the next screen. And the uh, next screen. Here we go. One, two, make sure three. I'm in both. Make sure I'm in both. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three, cheese. Cheese. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you, everybody. Love the session. Thank bye you, bye. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.